Welcome to the Skeptic Zone, the podcast from Australia for science and reason. Yes, it's the Skeptic Zone podcast episode number 725 for the 28th of August 2022. Lots of numbers there. Richard Saunders coming to you this week from Sydney, Australia, where the weather is okay. It was raining a bit, but I think today's going to be okay. But a cloudy sky is not good for (gasps) astrologers. Actually, they don't care. It's astronomers who would rather have a clear sky because astrologers tend to look at uh, charts and make things up. Mm. Well, our first story, our first report coming up today is about astrology on TikTok. Now, in the past, we've looked at things like homeopathy on TikTok or ghost hunting on TikTok. Today, we're going to be looking at people casting horoscopes or telling you all about your personality using astrology on TikTok. What can we learn? We can actually learn something. You'd be surprised. Following that, it's the Australian Skeptics Newsletter, read once again by Adrian Hill in Canada. Hello, Adrian. And I must thank Adrian very much because a few nights ago, she stayed up until three, four o'clock by the time it was all over, 4 a.m., to give a presentation for Sydney Skeptics in the Pub all about spirit photography. And that presentation should be up on YouTube uh, before long. And uh, I'll see if I can remember to add a link to that in next week's show notes. Then it's another instalment in the Book of Tim. The Book of Tim with Tim Mendham, a three-part series starting today. A three-part series about the unicorn. Do unicorns exist? Have unicorns ever existed? These may seem like simple questions, questions to which the answers are well known. The History of the Unicorn, a three-part series, part one today, coming up in the Book of Tim. After that, it's another sceptical poem by our dear departed late mate Jim Wilshire, our voiceover man. And this week's poem is a very short poem, and it's called God's Dad. Then to round off the show, we go back to the Trove Archives to look for references to the Bermuda Triangle, or the Devil's Triangle, which seemed to be a very big deal when I was younger, in the 1970s. There was lots of talk about the Bermuda Triangle. There was even a song about it. Who sang that song? Barry Manilow. Yes, the Bermuda Triangle. Is it as mysterious as we seem to remember? A big shout out to all those people in the past week who managed to get their driving license. Well done. My best advice to you is don't tailgate. Keep a healthy, respectable, big gap between the car in front of you and you. It gives you lots of time to break, lots of time for other people to make errors and for you to take evasive action. My other advice to you is A stop sign, which is a big red sign which says stop, means you must come to a complete stop. That reminds me of my old mate Jim, Jim Wilshire once again, who was a part-time driving instructor. And he was amazed at how many times people rolled through a stop sign. Two bits of advice, young drivers. And if you've had a birthday in the last week, or you know somebody special who's had a birthday, happy birthday to them or to you. But that's enough from me. Now it's time to run down the stairs and just have some nice hot buttered toast with honey. What could be better? While I do that, I hope you enjoy The Skeptic Zone. TikTok, the worldwide sensation which has millions of people addicted every day to scroll crazily through, looking at all sorts of things. And in the past, here on the Skeptic Zone, we've looked at various TikTokers, especially the live ones, talking about paranormal goings-on, ghost hunters, which was very interesting, 
homeopathy and tarot card readings. So keeping with that sort of theme, today I thought we'd look at various TikTokers, talkers, TikTokers on TikTok, talking about astrology. One of the things we've long maintained in the skeptical organizations is that, well, when it comes to such basic astrology as are you an Aries, are you a Libra, are you a Taurus, etc., that a lot of it boils down to receiving what we call Barnum Statements or the Barnum Effect. And just to remind you, or if you are new to this sort of thing, what is a Barnum Statement or the Barnum Effect? Wikipedia says the Barnum Effect, also called the Faraw Effect, is less commonly the Barnum Faraw Effect. However, it is a common psychological phenomenon whereby individuals give high accuracy ratings to descriptions of their personality that are supposedly tailored specifically to them, yet which are in fact vague and general enough to apply to a wide range of people. This effect can provide a partial explanation for the widespread acceptance of some paranormal beliefs and practices such as astrology, fortune telling, aura reading, and some types of personality tests. And we found that this effect is widespread through a lot of what, uh, what is loosely called the paranormal, the supernatural, especially when it comes to reading people. I've seen it used in all manner of uh, places, uh, in all manner of guises. Face reading, for example. Palm reading is a classic example. We heard about that a couple of weeks ago on The Skeptic Zone with Ray Hyman. Probably a century ago, it could have even been phrenology. There's a great example of this, which James Randi gave me many years ago, which I've used ever since, where you give 12 people what appears to be a detailed astrological reading based on their star sign. And uh, at the end of the day, all the readings are identical. Yet, many times they will rate each uh, their own reading very highly. If you give somebody a reading, a page of information, say this is a specific um, bit of information just for you, based on your birth date and your astrological readings by our well-respected astrologer. And you can get very high results, even though all 12 are identical. Bearing all that in mind, bearing all that in mind, let's have a listen to some of the pre-recorded, not live this time, pre-recorded examples of various astrologers, or people claiming some sort of knowledge of astrology, on TikTok. And our first TikToker giving advice about astrology is uh, somebody under the handle of Evan Nathaniel Grimm. If you have your sun, moon, or rising in Aries, Taurus, Gemini, Capricorn, Aquarius, or Pisces, then this is what's coming for you in August 2022. Capricorn, you're realizing you're not where you need to be financially, and so you'll look for other ways to gain resources. You're disappointed your career isn't bringing in enough. Otherwise, your creativity is peaking, which could give you an outlet from these financial frustrations. You're also reflecting on conversations you've had since early May. One of these conversations will be followed up with and give you a new opportunity. Aquarius, you're going to acknowledge how much you've limited yourself by fitting into clear societal expectations. You're releasing some sense of self-consciousness here, helping you decide to become your own unique individual and not care about how society can or can't define you or your profession. In the process, you may upset someone in your family. This confrontation will actually strengthen your resolve to do things your own way. Pisces, you're getting the download of the so, century early this week. bear in mind what I said before about the Barnum effect and ignore the star signs he said at the beginning. Those sort of statements could apply in one sense or other to many people, regardless of star sign. And remember, when somebody goes and pays for a reading and believes in it, then they're very inclined to hear what they want out of a reading and really think, it applies to them. Now let's listen to another TikToker under the name of Electra Soul. She's completely right. Your rising sign is the person that you are. Of course, the other placements are important, but the sun only rules the ego. The rising sign shows who you truly are on the inside. So with that being said today, guys, I'm going to be talking about the traits of every rising sign and how they make you who you are. The first thing that you're going to do is you're going to go figure out what your rising sign is. I am going to be putting the link down in the comments so that y'all can go figure it out for yourselves. 
but I will say that you do need to know what time you were born at to figure out what your rising is. So if you do know what time you were born at or the closest estimate, let's figure out what your rising sign represents for you right now. In this part one, we're only going to be covering Aries because I don't got enough time. <laughs> but if you're an Aries rising baby girl, you are a fighter. You like to deal with challenges and you're also very individual. You hate being told what to do and I promise you, you will be anybody's ass if you really had to. Your soul loves to start new projects as you're always looking for a new high. The edge of fire in your rising sign is always going to show So I that. think, once again, you might agree with me that that was nothing except classic Barnum statements. And also, we discover that with many Barnum statements, they are flattering. They always give you the best. Well, not always, but often will give you the best aspects of yourself or what you hope to be the best aspects of yourself, like you're a fighter, etc. Now let's hear what user Hannah Henninger has to say. The most beautiful woman in astrology, in my humble opinion. Libra women. Lucky, lovely Libras. You guys are like human Barbies. Plus, you have the cutest, most unique style ever. Taurus women. Oh my god. <laughs> Audrey Hepburn was a Taurus, and I always just think of her when I think of Taurus women. Just super feminine and classy. But Loki a freak. <laughs> Pisces women have the most beautiful dreamy eyes. Don't get this twisted, Sagittarius sun women are beautiful. But Sagittarius rising women? <sighs> they hit different. Leo girls, all knockouts. That's literally what they're known for. Scorpio women. They're beautiful, but like unconventionally beautiful they're truly otherworldly the same can be said about aquarius women so they're once again unique. once again what we could call barnum statements for sure with a liberal dose of flattery for each one and of course if you're listening to that and you happen to be one of those star signs and you kind of believe in this stuff you'd hear great things about yourself need i say more let's move on to our next tiktoker and here we have a user simply called Amy, who's going to be telling us that we can use astrology to figure out where we should be living for certain activities. Did you know that you can use astrology to figure out where you should live in the world? It's called astrocartography, and it shows you the different experiences you'll have in different parts of the world. So this is what my astrocartography chart looks like. Your sunline shows you where you'll be successful and happy, where you'll develop a good reputation, and where you'll make many friends. If you live close to your Mars line, you will have a lot of ambition, motivation, and drive to succeed and work hard. Your moon line is where you'll feel comfortable, safe, and most at home. Your Mercury line is where you'll learn a lot. It's a great place for networking, making friends, and being social. Your Venus line shows you where you will have the best love life and social life. You will be indulging yourself here and having a lot of fun. This is a beautiful place to live. Your Jupiter line shows you the best places in the world where you can live. You will be happy and successful in all areas of your life here. Your Saturn line shows you where life may be challenging. You may experience setbacks or disappointments. You may have to work very hard here. You'll experience a lot of surprises, changes. It goes on to the other planets. It's uh, interesting because she shows us what the chart looks like. It's the whole planet, well, a flat, plain a map of the planet with lots of uh, lines drawn down, each line representing a different planet out there in the solar system. Who knew? Who knew? How about that? Now let's move on to user Jade. What does Jade have to tell us? Today we are ranking the moon signs, most to least chaotic, so let's get into it. First up in our stability on 10 category, we have Taurus moons. Taurus moons are unfazed, they are the strength for the rest of us. Next up we have Libra moons. Libra moons value harmony and balance over everything. They're able to see all sides of a thing, they don't get carried away with their emotions. Next up we have Aquarius moons. Aquarius moons get a bad reputation for being detached. But in reality, they're analytical, they're logical, that's that's where they're comfortable, that's how they operate, and that's fine. Last I think you're starting to get the idea. I think you're starting to get the idea, no matter how many of these I've come across. Again and again and again and again, we're falling right back into Barnum statements. So just take away the star sign at the beginning, and these statements can certainly apply to a wide range of people, especially, as I said before, if you really want it to work, you'll make it fit. So I'll round off this by once again going back to the wiki page about the Barnum sect. 
because there's some other really good examples here. And I think these are similar to some of the examples James Randi gave me many years ago. And see, dear listener, see if these apply to you. One, you have a great need for people to like and admire you. Two, you have a tendency to be critical of yourself. Three, you have a great deal of unused capacity which you have not turned to your advantage. Four, while you have some personality weaknesses, you are generally able to compensate for them. Five, your sexual adjustment has presented some problems for you. Six, disciplined and self-controlled outside, you tend to be worrisome and insecure inside. Seven, at times you have serious doubts as to whether you've made the right decision or done the right thing. Eight, you prefer a certain amount of change and variety and become dissatisfied when hemmed in by restrictions and limitations. Nine, you pride yourself as an independent thinker and do not accept other statements without satisfactory proof. Ten, you have found it unwise to be too frank in revealing yourself to others. Eleven, at times you are extroverted, affable, sociable, while at other times you are introverted, wary, reserved. Twelve, some of your aspirations tend to be pretty unrealistic. Thirteen, security is one of your major goals in life. There we go, and those statements don't differ very much at all to the so-called astrological statements we heard from those TikTokers. I recommend that uh, if you're interested in this sort of thing, you look up and study the Barnum Effect, because you'd be amazed how many times it comes up again and again when looking into paranormal claims of, well, being able to tell by paranormal or supernatural methods, information about people you couldn't have possibly known. So there we are, a quick look at some of the astrology on TikTok. Hi, this is Rob Palmer. I write the well-known Skeptic column in Skeptical Inquirer Online, and I'm a team member of the Guerrilla Skeptics on Wikipedia Project, GSOW. But you fine folks may know me because I contributed segments for several episodes of this podcast. Check out my interviews from PsyCon 2019, starting with episode 576. So here's a little known fact. All of my skeptical activism stems from discovering the Skeptic Zone. Yep, I first heard of the GSOW project right here back in 2012 due to Richard's selfless support of it and other skeptical activities around the world. I can honestly say I'd likely still be a skeptical couch potato if I hadn't discovered this podcast. So besides giving back to the zone by contributing occasional segments, I contribute to the success of the show with ongoing monthly micropayments. And I'm asking you to consider doing the same. You can do that by following the Patreon or PayPal links at skepticzone.tv. Every donation supports the show, and Richard will really appreciate it. everyone, this is Adrian Hill from Canada here to read the highlights from the Australian Skeptics Newsletter. This is newsletter number 155. You can subscribe to this newsletter and get it delivered to your inbox every other week, complete with links to all the stories. Just visit www.skeptics.com.au. But now, let's see what Tim Mendham has for us this week. Hi all, says Tim. One of the hazards of putting on a convention is other events running at the same time. Skepticon 2022's only competitor on the weekend of November 26th through 27th in Canberra was a one-day music festival with very little overlap between the audience for either event. Except 
that the music festival audience managed to take virtually every piece of accommodation in Canberra and surrounding towns, leaving only top-end rooms at top-end prices. Not an issue for those locals attending Skepticon, but a disaster for anyone planning to come from elsewhere for what is, hopefully, the first in-person Skeptics Conference in three years. Thus, the Canberra Skeptics had to make the difficult decision to move the convention one week to December 3rd through 4th. Fortunately, they've managed to retain the list of speakers originally planned. Plus, there's the added benefit of a good supply of accommodation options at affordable prices. So book now before the skeptics take up all the accommodation in the nation's capital. Further details and ticket sales are available on the Skepticon website. Skepticon.org.au But for now, read on. Tim. Okay, Tim, we'll do just that. Structured water taken apart on Media Watch. ABC TV's media commentary program looks at claims of a special form of water with curative powers that you can make yourself with equipment for large amounts of money or bypass the equipment and buy the ready-made water, of course, for large amounts of money. The four-minute episode is as much concerned with journalistic conflicts of interest as pseudoscience, but there's plenty of grist for the skeptical mill. How many psychics' predictions came true? A good, simple example of doing the right thing with a psychic's predictions. Classify them from specific to vague, and then go back some time later, in this case 20 years, to see if they came true and, importantly, assess the wording used in the predictions to see the tricks of the trade. And what is really interesting is that this article is on a site devoted to the paranormal. And while you're digesting this, you should also look at the results of the major study of psychic predictions from Richard Saunders and his crew, published in the December 2021 issue of The Skeptic. 140 million dollars swindled by psychics and the victim's daughter. There are lots of stories of swindles among psychics. Normally, we won't bother covering these as there are bad people in the non-psychic world too. Trouble is, the environment in which one believes in psychic powers leaves little room for the, quote, hang on, there's something wrong here, end quote, sort of critical thinking. And this case was particularly noteworthy. A Brazilian woman's daughter was part of a scheme to swindle her 82-year-old mother out of more than $140 million worth of art by using a ring of supposed psychics who claimed the paintings were cursed a salutary lesson in the dangers of unfounded beliefs and those who will take advantage of them. Very sad story. Do paranormal beliefs indicate poor mental health? New data, quote, supports the normality and adaptability of paranormal beliefs, end quote. Countering, quote, the incorrect assumption that belief in the paranormal is directly associated with poor psychological functioning slash adjustment, end quote. The figures are a little confusing as it seems that there are people with high levels of paranormal belief and psychopathology, but people of moderate and low levels of belief were just as mentally well as each other, which would seem to say that belief in the paranormal does link to psychopathology. We'll have to give that one some thought. The Ups and Downs of Reiki A sort of article that has a bet each way. Reiki is pseudoscience and doesn't work, but it works. Maybe it's the article's English as a second language style that causes some confusion, or maybe it's just that they do want a bet each way, or just paying lip service to science. Probably the latter. Quote, Reiki acts not only on a physical level, but is reflected on the emotional, spiritual, and mental level, returning all our levels to their natural state of balance, giving a sense of well-being and joy. The states of balance are due to the harmonization of the different energy centers, or chakras, causing muscle strains, vitality, and greater energy. Huh? <laughs> End quote. <laughs> what? Muscle strains, vitality, and greater energy? Okay. This might, therefore, more properly belong down in the bottom section of the newsletter. Ah, uh, yeah, I agree with that. 
The September issue of The Skeptic Magazine is in the works with a major look at the mysterious and often secretive world of organized exorcism in Australia, and not just from the Catholic Church. Plus, the latest on our Hall of Shame for alt-med practitioners, dowsing priests, tidal waves, and of course, frogs. And if you haven't subscribed yet, now is the time to do so. Contact the editor if you're not sure if your existing subscription needs renewing. Travel tip. And here we go again. Ghosts. <laughs> My favorite topic. <laughs> 10 of the most haunted places in Northern Ireland. There's a few pubs, a couple of castles, and a tree. A nice eclectic mix. Nearly all homes are haunted. A paranormal investigator has claimed that more than 90% of us likely have ghosts in our homes and offered advice about what to do if you suspect you might be living alongside the supernatural. Surprisingly, it's not, quote, hire a paranormal investigator, end quote. Instead, he says, quote, they're not there to scare you. Just completely ignore them, end quote. Good advice. <laughs> Silliest story of the week. Ex-psychic's warning about the paranormal. A piece entirely without irony. For a start, how can you be an ex-psychic? Okay, stop doing it. But if you believe you were a psychic, then you probably still are. Except, of course, once you realize that, quote, mediums are actually convening with evil, end quote. I.e., grandma or grandpa in the afterlife is actually a demon trying to seduce you to the dark side. Then the ex-psychic becomes an avid fundamentalist Christian. Quote, if you go down the wrong road, it just takes one tarot card reader on TikTok, one person in the new age, one love and lighter to tell you that you are gifted, end quote, she said. Quote, and you are going to go down the rabbit hole of destruction, end quote. Hmm. Well, that's all for now. Until next time, this is Adrienne Hill signing off from the land of bobcats. Yes, we have a family wandering around our neighborhood. Bunnies uh, that the bobcats eat and bears that you need to travel to the mountains to see. Thank goodness. This is Kyle from the Data Skeptic Podcast. If you're curious about the way data is changing our world, topics like AI and all this craziness with Facebook and bots and the Twitter storm and how the algorithms that underline that work, uh, and you don't want a technical deep dive, you want it you know, in the vernacular in a way that people can understand, check us out at Data Skeptic. That's what we try and do. I interview advanced professionals in the field who do this sort of research, and then I get into interesting projects as well. We're a weekly show, and you can find us at dataskeptic.com. And now, a reading from the Book of Tim. With Tim Mendham. Hi, my name is Tim Mendham. I'm the Executive Officer of Australian Skeptics, and I'm also editor of our magazine, The Skeptic. And today I'll be reading an article that we published, first of all, in the March 2015 issue of the magazine. And it's actually a reprint of a classic article that was first published in 1994, which is before Richard was born. And this article is called On the Horn of a Dilemma. Now, you get this, On the Horn of a Dilemma, because it's about about unicorns. It's written by a fellow named Anthony Wheeler, and he asks if the science can get to the point of the unicorn. And he starts, do unicorns exist? Have unicorns ever existed? This may seem like simple questions, questions to which the answers are well known. Nevertheless, they are not. We cannot select our answers from just yes or no. The answers have been sought for hundreds of years, and even now, the answers are not simple. Science strictly means knowledge. Major methods of knowing are intuition, authority, rationalism, personal experience, and science. 
science as we usually use the term, is the study of accumulated knowledge and how it was produced using the principles of replication and trial by experiment. It is science's scepticism about existing knowledge that drives our need for replication and for trial by experiment. So how does science contribute to our knowledge of unicorns? How have these other methods of knowing contributed? And when there was conflict, which type of knowledge dominated? As for the answers, the mythical magical unicorns never have existed. Though natural one-horned animals without magical powers have existed, like the rhinoceros, top-horned animals have been inadequately described and misinterpreted as unicorns. And two-horned animals may well have been made into unicorn-like one-horned animals. So let's start with the unicorn myth. Of all the fabulous beasts, the unicorn is special in that it is very beautiful and has no interest in man. The unicorn is the composite of power and purity, force and love, of strength and righteousness. Bigger than a horse, as powerful as an ox, and armed with a single horn more than a metre long, it is a noble beast that symbolises true and deep love. The single horn is bright and sharp, so sharp that it pierces flesh with ease. And the unicorn is coloured, a pure white body with the horn black, white and crimson from top to bottom. The unicorn is a noble creature, living alone with no need of man. They live far away in deserts and solitary on the tops of mountains. The unicorn is powerful, too powerful for any man to hunt. If a lion meets a unicorn, the lion runs to the nearest tree for safety. If desperately outnumbered and cornered, the unicorn will leap from a cliff to land impaled upon its horn, unharmed to then run away to safety. But the unicorn may be taken by trickery and guile, using a pure lady, young and innocent. A virgin is recommended. Dress her with care and seat her in a pretty glade and wait. A sweet song may help. The unicorn is a creature of love. The unicorn is too powerful for man, but is enchanted by a woman's capacity for love. The unicorn passing by a virgin or young maiden cannot help but pause to approach, to lay quietly with his head resting lightly in the lady's lap. Sing soft, sing low. Your unicorn is now vulnerable. Your unicorn may now be attacked. But do not aim to capture him because no man can restrain such power. All you may do is take his life, and as he lies gentle and quiet, without warning, thrust in your sword with all your strength, and again, and again. You may yet fail, and the beast may still escape, but you may just succeed. You may still the savage heart, the strong limbs, the beauty, and the glory. The horn is magic, destroying all poison. Place your food or drink into a cup made from the horn, and however poisoned it may have been, it will now be safe to eat or drink. Or add a sliver of horn to your drink to purify it. Just place a horn on the table, and any poison nearby will make the horn sweat. A little horn ground and taken, called sugar of the horn, will even cure sickness. Beat and boil the horn in wine, and your teeth will be made white and clear. As the poem says, the unicorn is noble, he keeps him safe and high upon a narrow path and steep climbing to the sky, and there no man can take him. He scorns the hunter's dart, and only a virgin's magic power shall tame his haughty heart. And that's a German medieval folk song. Let's look at the Chinese unicorn. Science is associated with Western democracies, but the lack of science is not so restricted. On the other side of the world, the Chinese had their unicorn too. The Chinese unicorn... The Qi Lin, or Qin, is a most significant animal, the foremost of all the 360 animals on Earth. This unicorn has the body of a deer, the tail of an ox, the hooves of a horse, and a short, fleshy horn and five-coloured coat. The Chinese unicorn is so gentle that it takes care when walking not to tread on the tiniest of creatures and will not eat even grass, choosing rather only dead plants. To harm such a peaceful beast is naturally most serious. Even to just come across a dead unicorn is unlucky. The Chinese unicorn lives a thousand years and is a good omen. One of four magical, propitious animals, with the dragon, phoenix and tortoise, the unicorn's appearance 
foretells the birth of an honourable ruler. Apparently in the 13th century, one of the Emperor Genghis Khan's armies was turned back from its path of conquest by Chao Chuan, a variant of the Chinese unicorn, announcing, it is time for your master to return to his own land. Let's look at the source of the unicorn myth. It all started with the Jewish text Talmud, where a great ox with one horn was the lead animal in Adam's herd and was Adam's first sacrifice to God. Come the flood, the poor unicorn's huge size meant that there was no room for it to join Noah's refugees in the ark, and the unicorn had to swim along behind, occasionally resting the tip of his horn on the ark. This loss of the unicorn in Noah's flood is the theme for a song. Now the cause of its demise here is tardiness rather than immense size. Then Noah looked out through the driving rain, but the unicorns were hiding, playing silly games. They were kicking and a splashing while the rain was pouring. Oh, them foolish unicorns. Which is uh, the unicorn by Shel Silverstein, 1962. And that's recorded by the Irish Rovers in 1968. It was a big hit. Christians found the idea of the unicorn's extinction in the flood repugnant. Extinction itself was considered blasphemy. No all-powerful god would allow one of his creatures to be lost. The myth was established and given substance by Chryseus, a travelling writing Greek physician, who went as court physician to Persia in 416 BCE. Chryseus described an Indian animal as being larger than a horse and white with a dark red head and dark blue eyes. A single horn, 450 millimetres long, came from the forehead, the bottom pure white, the upper part sharp and crimson, and the middle black. And this horn, either powdered or made into a cup, protected from poisons, convulsions, and epilepsy. This animal sounds mainly like the Asian rhinoceros, with part Indian wild ass, part Tibetan antelope, a lot of imagination and gullibility thrown in. Indeed, it is the sort of account we would expect from second, third, and more hand accounts of travellers' tales each reteller eager to impress others of the wonders they have seen. On several occasions when writing in the Old Testament about the strong and untamable wild ox, the authors had used the Hebrew word for rim or oxen, but the Jews of Alexandria, translating these books into Greek in about 250 BCE, substituted the Greek word monocorus, or one horn. In Latin, this became unicornus, unus meaning one, Corners meaning horn. In English, unicorn. The dominant English translation of the Bible, the authorised King James Version of 1611, widely used by the Protestant churches, continued the use of unicorn. Dr. Martinus Luther of Germany wrote of the Einhorn. The Revised Standard Version of the Bible has reintroduced wild ox. Quote from Numbers chapter 23, verse 22. God brought them out of Egypt. He, Israel, hath, as it were, the strength of a unicorn. From Psalm 92, verse 10, But my horn shalt thou exalt like the horn of a unicorn. I shall be anointed with fresh oil. And from the book of Job, 39, verses 9 to 10, Will the unicorn be willing to serve thee, or abide by thy crib? Canst thou bind the unicorn with his band in the furrow, or will he harrow the valleys after thee? This mistranslation was due to the Alexandrian ignorance of the wild ox, from which modern domestic cattle have descended, and in their time have been hunted to rarity, but with knowledge of the Indian single-horned rhinoceros. Also, the influence of early Assyrian and Persian artistic style, where oxen were pictured only in profile, with only a single horn visible, contributed to the misinterpretation. The original authors and editors of the Bible had no intention of implying that the ram, ox, had a single horn, as demonstrated by the use of the plural horns in the horns of the unicorns which is from Deuteronomy 33, 17. They were just inadequately describing an animal that was so familiar to the original authors and readers that no description was needed or given and having trouble with an appropriate translation for its name. Now, the wild ox was massive, nearly seven foot tall, with tremendous strength and ferocity. And these attributes came to be associated with the mistranslated unicorn, and especially so when the wild ox became extinct in the 16th century. Now, that's part one of this article, and we will be having two more parts of this article coming up where we'll be looking at the personal experience of travellers and eventually the scientific approach to unicorns. But that's uh, the On the Horn of a Dilemma from the Skeptic magazine, March 2015. 
And you can download the whole article and indeed the whole issue of the magazine from our website, www.skeptics.com.au. And while you're there, you might as well subscribe too and do yourself a favour. God's dad. The father of God looked down on God, wondered what he'd done. Had he created a monster who had demonstrably killed the fun? He tried to raise a child of the world to a God of grace and good. Schooled him in all the cool stuff, in as much as a godfather could. He finally blamed God's mother for their son's particular bent. Claimed she'd cheated his genes, but that's as far as he went. So he washed his hands of his son and heir, shrugging as he did. And he put the universe back in the box and firmly shut the lid. Time once again to dive into those pages, look into those pages, peer into those pages, prod those pages at Trove at trove.nla.gov.au, the online resource from the Australian Government and the National Library of Australia. However, while I recommend you visit that site, this week we are going further afield and looking at various newspapers in the United States. And this week's topic, a, uh, another classic, another classic of scepticism, the Bermuda Triangle. Now, this is something you really don't hear about much anymore. Certainly when I was growing up and in the early days of skepticism, it was a major topic, a major uh, point of investigation. But let's have a look quickly over at Skeptic's Dictionary at skep dic.com and see what it has to say about the uh, the subject Bermuda or Devil's Triangle The Bermuda Triangle also known as the Devil's Triangle is a triangular area in the Atlantic Ocean bounded roughly at its points by Miami, Bermuda and Puerto Rico. Legend has it that many people, ships and planes have mysteriously vanished in the area how many have mysteriously disappeared depends on who is doing the locating and the counting. The size of the triangle varies from 500,000 square miles to three times that size, depending on the imagination of the author. Some include the Azores, the Gulf of Mexico, and the West Indies in the triangle. Some trace the mystery back to the time of Columbus, even so, estimates range from about 200 to no more than 1,000 incidents in the past 500 years. Howard Rosenberg claims that in 1973, the U.S. Coast Guard answered more than 8,000 distress calls in the area, and that more than 50 ships and 20 planes have gone down in the Bermuda Triangle within the last century. Now, this story goes on to talk about famous cases from the Bermuda Triangle, including Flight 19 in 1945, and mentions that over the years there have been dozens of articles, books, and television programs promoting the mystery of the Bermuda Triangle. In his study of the material, Larry Kirsch found that few did any investigation into the mystery. Rather, they passed on the speculations of their predecessors as if they were passing on the mantle of truth. The conclusion towards the end of this page, in short, the mystery of the Bermuda Triangle became a mystery by kind of communal reinforcement among uncritical authors and a willing mass media to uncritically pass on the speculation that something mysterious is going on in the Atlantic. A similar phenomenon for the Pacific was also promoted by Berlitz for what is called the Dragon's Triangle. But, uh, but as I mentioned before, especially for those of us who remember back to the 1980s, 1970s, the Bermuda Triangle seemed to be a real, a real hotspot for mysteries. And we begin our readings from the Gastonia Gazette, Sunday the 27th of April 1975. 
And this is a story by Philip Nobile. Kirsch, the Bermuda Triangle is dead. Nothing gives me greater journalistic pleasure than debunking fakery. A few months ago in this column, I interviewed Charles Berlitz, the author of the number one non-fiction bestseller, The Bermuda Triangle. Although I challenged Berlitz's fanciful otherworldly explanations for ship and plane disappearances in the so-called Bermuda Triangle region off the coast of Florida. I knew nothing about the actual facts surrounding the disappearances. But Lawrence David Kirsch, thank heaven, does. The indefatigable research librarian at Arizona State University spent the last couple of years putting together the pieces of the legend in a book entitled The Bermuda Triangle Mystery, Solved. According to Kirsch, there is no mystery at all. If I were Berlitz or any other believer in the triangle, I'd be awfully ashamed. The next section of the report deals with his interview with Kirsch. Question. I don't suppose you have any respect for Bermuda Triangle mythmakers. Answer. Either it's outright fraud, or they are people with much curiosity. Gullibility and ignorance of the facts seems to distinguish their work. Question. Why would an intelligent man bother to refute such a preposterous legend as the Bermuda Triangle? Answer. I didn't set out to refute anything. When I began my research, I didn't believe or disbelieve in the Bermuda Triangle. Only after I started questioning and checking into certain disappearances did I part company with the popularizers of the myth. Question. How did the legend of the Bermuda Triangle gain such currency? Answer. In 1965, Vincent Gladys published a book entitled Invisible Horizons with a chapter on the triangle. Gladys' information was based on a few sketchy articles that mentioned strange disappearances in this area and on some sensational UFO books. After Gladys, various magazines like Sage, Agassi and Cosmopolitan featured articles on the triangle. And now there are two bestsellers on the subject, Berlitz in hardcover and John Wallace Spencer's The Limbo of the Lost in soft. Question. The government spent millions studying UFOs. So why hasn't there been a similar investigation of the triangle, which involves real craft and real victims? Answer. But the Air Force, Navy and Coast Guard have conducted investigations of all individual incidents. They are satisfied that no mystery exists. Therefore, no large inquiry is necessary. Question. Is there anything special about the triangle in terms of disappearances, or do other ocean areas have similar rates of sunken ships and downed airplanes? Answer. Historically, I found probably twice as many disappearances between New York, Boston, and Europe than have been reported in the triangle. But ever since Gladys, triangle experts have been on the lookout for new incidents. Naturally, disappearances do continue in this area. However, there may be just as many between Newfoundland and Ireland. But who notices? Question. Berlitz points out that in all the disappearances in the Triangle, not a single survivor has emerged. How do you account for the vanishing act of both craft and crew? Answer. That's simple. Berlitz emphasizes only this sort of incident. He ignores the thousands of successful searches the Coast Guard conducts every year in the Triangle. Question. Even Triangle specialists grant that a good number of mishaps can be attributed to natural causes, but they also insist too many disappearances have no rational explanation. Is there a single Triangle incident that you cannot account for logically? Answer. Not one. I discovered an amazing variance with the available facts in popular descriptions of triangle disappearances. For example, some writers would remark that the weather was clear when there was actually a hurricane blowing. Or they cite the sudden failure of the craft's sophisticated radio equipment when it is well known to anyone who flies or sails that radio communication often fades and dead spots are frequent. There's just nothing mysterious about losing radio contact. 
question. Why do planes and crew disappear with such frequency? Why don't they ditch in the water and yield survivors? Answer. Most of these planes were downed at night, and the chances of a safe ditching on the ocean at night are practically zero. First of all, the plane is probably disabled, and secondly, without runway lights to aid depth perception, you can't even see the ocean. Question. Are there hidden hazards in search operations as well? Berlitz and company take pleasure in remarking that massive searches often fail to turn up wreckages. Answer. It's extremely difficult to sight even large objects in the water. Looking for a plane in the ocean is like looking for a needle in a field of haystacks. Often ground control doesn't realize a plane is down until several hours later. As a result, they can't locate its position. These are crucial details triangle experts neglect. Question. If there's one incident that lends credence to the triangle mystery, it's the weird disappearance of five Navy bombers on a routine training mission off the Florida coast in December of 1945. Answer. According to the official Navy report, there's really no mystery about this famous flight. The flight leader, all the other pilots were trainees, became disorientated and or his compass may have failed. He was new to the area and couldn't get a fix for his correct position. After zigzagging around the Caribbean in different directions for several hours in bad weather, the squadron finally ran out of fuel and crashed. Since the squadron was out of communication for an hour before going down, the searchers could not immediately determine the crash site. So it should be no surprise that the bombers were never found. Question. You claim you solved the mystery of the Bermuda Triangle. How did you proceed? Answer. I took 50 of the most commonly cited disappearances in the Triangle and tried to trace down the original evidence. I checked newspaper microfilms, read government reports, and corresponded with foreign maritime agencies and Lloyds of London. In general, I concluded that the so-called experts either invented, distorted, or simply repeated already questionable facts relating to the disappearances. For example, in the case of the Stavanger, an alleged Norwegian freighter that vanished in 1931, I learnt from the Norwegian Director General of Shipping and Navigation that no such ship ever existed. Question. What is the solution to the mystery of the Bermuda Triangle? Answer. The evidence forces me to conclude that no single theory solves the mystery. It is no more logical to try and find a common cause for all the disappearances in the Triangle than to try to find one cause for all automobile accidents in Arizona. It's a manufactured mystery built on poor research and fostered by misconception. What an interesting interview that was, all the way back in 1975. And now we jump ahead to the 5th of June, 1991, in the Gaston Gazette. A story by Graham Hawkes, Treasure Hunter. Lost planes not found, found planes not lost. Bermuda Triangle, myth still alive and kicking. Miami Beach, Florida, Associated Press. Five World War II-era Navy planes found off the Florida coast, baffled explorers announced Tuesday, saying the mix-up will only reinforce the myth of the Bermuda Triangle. Graham Hawkes, leader of a team aboard the high-tech treasure-hunting ship Deep Sea, and that's S-E-E, -E, said more detailed examination of the Navy Avengers spotted last month by a remote camera showed they were not the planes of Flight 19, which vanished on December the 5th, 1945. The Bermuda Triangle, I'm afraid, if you want to find mystery, is probably even aliver and weller than it was before. Hawk said, Flight 19 vanished during a training flight that was to include a bombing run on a deserted Bahamian island. Radio transmissions heard at their base at Fort Lauderdale indicated the pilots became disorientated while flying towards the Bahamas and believed they were flying over the Florida Keys in the Gulf of Mexico. 
No trace of the planes or pilots was ever found. Their disappearance helped fuel the myth of the Bermuda Triangle, an area bounded by Bermuda, Miami, and Puerto Rico, where ships and planes supposedly often vanish mysteriously. The five planes found by the deep sea were in good condition under 550 to 750 feet of water, about 10 miles northeast of Fort Lauderdale. We're all within one and a half miles of each other, Hawks said. The coincidence of the plane number could be explained by the Navy's reuse of numbers from lost or destroyed planes, Hawks said. The strongest evidence had been that the Navy had never lost five Avengers together except for Flight 19. But after looking more carefully at the wrecks, the team now believes the five planes went down in four or five separate incidences over a period of several years. And there we are, a couple of reports dealing with the so-called Bermuda Triangle or the Devil's Triangle. Here, a copy of Flim Flam. Well, I might as well say that in the front cover here, it's written to Richard Saunders, my valued Aussie pal, James Randi, 28, 11, 2010. Isn't that nice? What a great thing that is to have. But chapter three of Flim Flam, and if you haven't read Flim Flam, it's certainly, certainly uh, a must read for any skeptic. Chapter 3, All at Sea, and this deals with Berlitz and the Bermuda Triangle, and even mentions Larry Kirsch, and is very much worth a read. And Randy concludes his chapter by saying to Charles Berlitz, I say, Charlie, if you ever do find a pyramid in the ocean via sonar, it will look on your chart much like the Empire State Building because of the vertical exaggeration of the recording technique. And if you ever say you have found the Empire State Building somewhere in the Caribbean, I won't be the least bit surprised. Flim Flam, and that's uh, published by Prometheus Books. Although those two uh, reports came to us from American newspapers, don't forget you can find a wealth of information in Australian newspapers or newspapers, I'm sure, no matter where you're listening to us from around the world. Because when you go to Trove or other digital newspapers, you'll never know what you might find. Thank you for listening to The Skeptic Zone. Next week, I hope to bring you the Trove segment all about signs of the Zodiac, a skeptical poem by Jim Wilshire about the Zodiac, uh, the part two, part two of the Book of Tim talking about unicorns, and, well, I'm not sure what else. Thank you to all those people who continue to support The Skeptic Zone or those people who have just come on board as sponsors via Patreon or PayPal, and you can do that at skepticzone.tv. And if you go there to check out the uh, the webpage and all the show notes, on the right-hand side, you'll see a link to all the videos of Jim Wilshire's poetry that I shot with Jim about uh, 15 years ago on his lovely property in the rolling hills and the rolling river. But for this week, this is Richard Saunders signing off from Sydney, Australia. You've been listening to the Skeptic Zone podcast. Please visit our website at www.skepticzone.tv for show notes, contacts, and to access the back catalogue of episodes going back to 2008. You can follow the Skeptic Zone podcast on Twitter at Skeptic Zone, visit our Facebook page, or leave a review on iTunes. You can also support The Skeptic Zone via Patreon or PayPal. The Skeptic Zone podcast is an independent production. The views and opinions expressed on The Skeptic Zone are not necessarily those of Australian skeptics or any other skeptical organisations.